Appreciate you streaming in on a football Friday morning here on the Birds 365 with Jack and Mac. I'm, I'm glad he got John talk. McMullen, Jody McDonald, and we see John Barcher there, uh, yeah. host of Look at the him. co-host Fell in the Bird podcast. I think he turned his radio down. Hello, John Barchard. How the hell are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm man. doing doing great, guys. How are you? I'm doing good, John. I love I love the confidence for people who can do this in their cars. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm not driving at the same time, too. So I just want to make everybody aware of that as well. But on the road to Indy, fellas. So hopefully yeah. uh, it's not a gash of uh, Jonathan Gannon for 250 yards or something crazy like that. Well, now we got every defensive tackle o- under the sun, John. How fired <laughs> up are you? And Dominic and Sue, Linval Joseph, the big name trap. Big names. Man, if this was 2013, I think we'd all be fired up. But, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's uh, – to me, I think it's – you know, it's what you're supposed to do. I mean, you lost two D tackles in the meantime. You need to stop – you need to do something about the running game. I don't care what they say or what the analytics are telling us. Like, Jordan Davis not being there has mattered. So – um, oh, yeah. I will take anything to kind of like make sure that uh, basically the offense can get back on track because that's that's what happened in Washington. And um, you, you need to make uh, make them, you know, some negative plays here. And hopefully they can uh, provide that for him. Do uh, we read into this at all that maybe Jordan Davis isn't going to be back in a couple of weeks? IR means four weeks. The Eagles are rather secretive about information on the uh, severity of injuries and I mean, we what timelines look like. To our defensive line. How much does so this uh, signify to Come you on. that, that Jordan Davis might not be back in a couple weeks? Okay, excuse me. Yeah, I think this is is a part of that. I also think it's a big, big reason that, like, you know, I mean, Fletcher Cox has not been playing that well but on top of that. Um, and we saw that if you get him into a really bad situation in 70 snaps, like, uh, I think some of this is on him as well. But, but yeah, I do think this is a, a little bit about Jordan Davis in the timeline. And you don't want to rush him back, especially if his, he's going to meet, like, the the Titans and that's going to be his first game. You know, that's a, that's a lot to kind of take on with uh, Derrick Henry, especially what we what I caught of last night anyway. It still seems like, you know, he's uh, still pretty ferocious. So, um, I, I, I don't what do you guys think? I don't, I don't think it's that much of an indictment on Jordan Davis's uh, injury or anything. I think it's just – uh, the D tackles haven't been playing that great collectively all year, in my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was my first thought, John, was it was a little bit of an overreaction to one bad game. Now, you know, I ran that up the flagpole at the Novacare Complex. They insisted it wasn't. Uh, they'd been talking to Sue for a longer period of time, so that was ev- evidently in the pipeline for at least a little bit. Now, Linball was there. He said the Eagles contact him a couple days ago. So that tells me that that's an impact of the game they just saw. And I think they do need a legitimate nose tackle. So the Linball Joseph signing makes a little bit more sense to me than the Indomitian Sue signing because, you know, Fletcher's a three technique. Javon Hargrave's most comfortable there. Milton Williams, who I thought was a young player they liked, but now I'm not so sure, is most comfortable in that position. I don't know. I, I, I think it was a little bit of an overreaction to one bad game. I mean, the big, the larger sample pot size is 8-1 and one with the third-ranked defense in the NFL. I mean, those are the raw numbers. Yeah, and the, the Sioux thing to me is a little – I mean, I don't think it's strange, but it's they've been it feels like they've been talking about him in some regard yeah. for like two off seasons now or linked here. Like yeah. maybe he was going to come here instead of Tampa the year before. But um, uh, I, I don't know if it's necessarily an overreaction or not. And that's something that like we're going to have to find out, because if Sue still has a, a good amount of juice left uh, and he can rotate with Fletcher Cox, you know, with that, if that's Joseph or when that's Davis, when he gets back and they can have. Uh, you know, better pass rushing in between uh, their their two prime defensive tackles now, I guess we can say, um, then I think that is a plus. But, uh, yeah, I kind of feel a little bit like you, Jody. Like, this was a big, like, overreaction uh, over – but we'll call it two bad running – run defense games, I guess. Yeah. John, you just said you thought that Fletcher Cox didn't play real well the other night. I've been saying for three days now that I didn't think Fletcher Cox played very well the other night. John again yesterday said, oh, Fletcher Cox played great the other night. We just had him out there for too many snaps. We're asking him to do a little bit too much. 
well, that kind of counts, and that goes into the grade, and I don't think – I'll stand by. I don't think Fletcher Cox played very well. Uh, these new signings, no, certainly, and Dominican no, when he gets up to speed, friends. will be cutting into those uh, defensive snaps that Fletcher has to play. Um, our, uh, th- this is all about the rest of this season, including a playoff run. Are we seeing the end of the Fletcher Cox era here in Philadelphia? Absolutely. Uh, and to me, um, you were trying to make that happen last year, right? Like, um, I, that's kind of part of like seeing Jordan Davis being so good is, you know, he made us forget that he completely, uh, Fletcher Cox and Jonathan Gannon, like, probably hate each other still. You know, like, it is oil and water in terms of what they want to do, or at least what I think Jonathan Gannon wants to do. And I know he's being killed this week. Rightfully so. I think everybody on the defense should be. But, like, that is still a humongous impasse for this defense, in my opinion. I don't know if that was Jeffrey Laurie or Howie Roseman demanding that Fletcher Cox had to be back here. But, like, clearly they're trying to steer away from a lot of a lot of 4-3 anything, you know. And that, I think that that's what Fletcher has been comfortable with his entire career. Um, and he's not a guy that's going to grip up you know, guards and centers and two gap and, you know, make these these linebackers flow to where I think Jonathan Gannon wants them to. And it's vastly different from Houston and Indy when you're seeing a lot of linebackers catch running backs, you know, instead of attacking them, they're just kind of waiting and sitting back. TJ Edwards, I would say, has been kind of flat footed the last two weeks in that regard as well. So I just don't think that their 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 philosophies line up. And I don't think Fletch is going <laughs> to learn anything new. So this is this is, again, I think why they bring in these two different guys so you can get the looks that Jonathan Gannon wants out of this uh, defense as well. Yeah, I definitely think Fletch would be more comfortable with Jim Swartz. But you, you said something uh, interesting, John, and I agree with you. Jonathan Gannon's been taking significant hits all week. That's fine. I mean, you lose a game the way they lose a game. But I do think the offense has kind of gotten a pass in that game. And the offense was, they contributed heavily to what went on with the three and outs, the turnovers. Even if you want to um, mix in, obviously they missed the call on Dallas Goddard. Still, this team had been plus 15. They'd been the uh, the best ball security so. team in the NFL. Um, and they start turning the football over. Too many three and outs. And oh, by the way, John, my biggest criticism of the of the offensive coaching staff was not realizing what was going on. In other words, when your defense is struggling and are they're on the field for 14, 15 plays, and you come back out, you're running tempo, and you go three, three and out like you're Chip Kelly, the snowball starts going down the hill. Do you think the offense got too much of a pass for the poor performance against. Uh, but it's, yeah, I, I actually think they get too much of a pass in general, uh, even with their their good games. You know, I'm still a little confused on like the rhythm and the timing and who's doing those decision makings in terms of like, all right, Nick's going to throw. We're going to go tempo here and we're going to roll with this. Or is that like what they think Jalen is comfortable with or what Jalen's told them they're comfortable with? So there is it seems like that that is um a, a big part of why we're talking about the defense so much this week. I agree with you, John. Like there's um, it's sloppy. Uh, the turnovers speak for themselves, but in terms of like, I don't know. I even suggested if, if they're playing the Colts this week, so it's on everybody's mind. But if Frank Reich wants to come and hang out here for the rest of the year, I think they need him. They need him. I, the, the explosiveness is there. The analytics are telling us that this is offense is just as good as Buffalo or the chiefs, but like, I don't know. It doesn't flow like them. It doesn't dominate like them it, uh, all game, at least. So, I, yeah, I think there's there's some tinkering to do, despite all the awesomeness that it's provided from A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts' year and all that. I was going to say, who on offense do you believe is underachieving right now? Uh, Shane Steichen. <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's just way too much talent here to have blimps on the radar your second year into this offense. Everyone seems to be more comfortable. And going back to John's point about why everybody's killing Jonathan Gannon, like the defense has looked the most comfortable with the most moving pieces of it with new additions, injuries, and whatever it is. It seems pretty consistent. It doesn't seem like the offense is as consistent. It's getting to like nitpicky territory because, again, it's an eight and one football team. But if you're going to like identify a struggle, I don't think this offense moves as well as its superstars do. 
Now, yeah, and, they have, there have John, been lulls. John, the John, second was just half quoting, lulls. John was quoting the overall numbers on the defense. Overall numbers on the offense? What Number, number three. Of, yeah. Number, number three, three in the league? Yeah. yeah. And, and you count that as underachieving, huh, John? <laughs> well, for people's expectations, absolutely. But we're in, when we're in Whose context, expectations were higher that the Eagles are going to be top three offense in the league before <laughs> the year started? <laughs> no, I don't think anybody thought that other than myself and Vince Quinn, for the record. But uh, I, I think that there is still like a, a, a patch of ice. If you're talking about like, can they beat a, a, an AFC Super Bowl team? There, there's still a little work to do, I think, because, you know, small stuff. That's all I mean. Yeah, well, people have talked about the second half lulls all season. The impressive thing, uh, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I think the offense has performed. And if, if, to answer Jody's question, like who was underachieved player-wise? I don't think anybody. Maybe Jordan Mailata, but that's injury-related. Um, and obviously he's playing through a, a very difficult shoulder problem. Uh, he might be the only player. Right this very second. I think Miles Sanders has had a career season. Uh, Jalen Hurts has obviously turned the corner, has become a franchise quarterback. Maybe Devontae Smith uh, had, had, you know, but I think he's in a different role. And now maybe he's got to step up a little bit uh, with Dallas Goddard being out. But that's who I want to talk about, John, because I think that is the best pure football player on the Eagles. I think if you, if you told me, obviously quarterback's more important, but if you told me who's just the best at what he does, I would put Dallas Goddard number one. And I think more important than that, because you can make the arguments for certain other players, the Eagles have a lot of good players. The biggest drop-off from starter to backup to me is Dallas Goddard to Jack Stoll or Grant Calcaterra or Tyree Jackson, whatever you want to go. Why is Howie calling defensive tackles? Why is he not calling Rob Gronkowski if you want to bring a veteran in here? Yeah, uh, uh, well, because Goddard is going to be back in, what, four is weeks he, more though? than likely? I don't is know. He? Yeah, they, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You might be right. They might still may have to make a call to Gronk. So um, uh, I think it's because – well, you guys tell me what you think of this. I think it's uh, – Devontae absolutely needs to step up. But this is kind of where I envision Nick Sirianni going to Zach Paschal in this type of role, and it's totally not going to be the same because you're going to have to create probably a two- or three-headed monster to, to find Dallas Goddard's production again. But I would assume some of those tunnel screens, those bubble screens that they love to run, uh, love to run with Dallas um, is going to go through him. Um, and then from outside of that, yeah, like Jack Stoll's not – I actually, for some ridiculous reason, I thought Jack still had a decent amount of targets this year, and he's dead like seven, nine, yeah. with four catches yeah. or something like that. So yeah. uh, it's, I, I think you're going to bring him in on 12 personnel to block. You're going to have Grant Calcutta probably out on routes a lot of the time, and then we'll see where Tyreek Jackson fits in. I know it's been popular to be like, oh, yeah, he'll be right out there and no problem. He'll be the pass catcher, but let's see him do it in an NFL game first because he hasn't done that yet. So. Right. That's where I think it's going to end up, and I, I agree. This is my concern more or less. This is where it really comes. I might look like a fool with my offensive takes, but like Dallas Goddard has been an incredible yak guy and safety valve at the same time. So yeah, I'm I'm very cautious that this offense might stall a little bit with him out of it. I uh, prediction out of both you two guys, which will we see more of? an extra tight end on the field or an extra wide receiver four wide outs with Zach Pascal on, or maybe even Zach Pascal replacing Quez Watkins, because what I'm for, uh, scared of most about the absence of Dallas Goddard is his ability to block. And we know that uh, his original replacement should be able to do a decent job, not as good as Goddard. That is one of Pascal's strength is blocking from the wide out position. Um, which do you think do we see more often, two tight ends or four wides? I personally think it's going to be more 12 personnel just because, like, they do need probably some extra help. Um, but maybe that will be determined on how how much the, you know, no, Jordan Mylotta and everybody else going is going to be uh, shored up. But I would, uh, John, I would say that's, that's probably going to be more 12 personnel than four wide. 
Yeah, uh, last one from me, John. I'll let you go so you can get to Indianapolis and hopefully the Eagles can get uh, back on the winning track and uh, host the Bell and the Bird. Everybody check out John's po- podcast with uh, Vince Quinn as well. Is that Vince in the background? Are you, do you got, Are you guys doing dual shows at the same time? Somehow, it's actually uh, sports guy Jamie, uh, Philly sports All right. guy, is along with us too. So the whole crew is going into Indy. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what, when I look at this team and I look at the NFC, the team I'm most concerned with is San Francisco. What, what, what is the team that you think could, could, on the on a particular game day, could maybe do the most to give the Eagles the trouble come playoff time. Yeah, that's mine too. In terms of like immediate, just because of probably all the surface reasons we've been talking about this week, Kyle Shanahan and his running game. Um, I know that Christian McCaffrey's kind of been up and down ever since that trade, and they definitely overpaid. But uh, yeah, I I feel like that's the only really big threat. Like if they're in a in a playoff run. Uh, if they're the first game somehow in the divisional race, um, I'd be – that's probably it, though. Like, I'm not really concerned about Dallas. I know the Vikings have been uh, the the hottest new flavor uh, after beating Buffalo. Uh, but Kirk Cousins is still Kirk Cousins to me. And if he's coming into Philadelphia at night or when it's going to get dark, that's not, that's not going to be an issue. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't know, guys. Like, I just really – don't see any big time like no, scary no, team like, and yeah, still nine line weeks line into the season I still think we're figuring out with the NFC maybe the Seahawks you know like I think that's another Gino Smith like, yeah Gino uh, Kirk, Kirk Cousins it's Kirk Cousins but Gino Smith still Gino Smith and Jimmy G still yeah. Jimmy G uh, yeah. that's why you have to like the Eagles chances uh, JB great stuff make it safe and sound Indy thanks for jumping in with us today appreciate it guys have a good one and uh, hopefully come back with a win you got Thanks, it. Thanks, John.